It's possible to imagine creating a polymer from different types of monomers. A polymer containing multiple different types of, of monomer units with different structures is known as a copolymer. Co evoking the idea that we've got two or more monomer units along the polymer chain. And there are four general ways that monomers can come together to form a copolymer. The first is basically an entirely random arrangement, what we might call a statistical copolymer. And this is a sort of random arrangement of monomers. And this is dictated by relative reactivity, stoichiometry, and just pure statistics, the likelihood of molecules bumping into each other. And so, for example, the relative reactivity of red with red and blue with blue in this particular case, along with the numbers of moles of red monomer and blue monomer that we're mixing up in the reaction mixture are going to affect the actual outcome. But basically, taking those off the table, this arrangement is essentially random, right? Whether we have a red or a blue in a particular position along the polymer chain is essentially random. Kind of the exact opposite of that is the perfectly ordered situation in an alternating copolymer where we have alternating monomer units, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. And that kind of regu regularity usually requires some clever synthetic strategies, right? Like one idea, one very simple idea is to tether together the monomers, creating kind of a super monomer um, of red and blue and have those polymerized to create an alternating copolymer like this. There are other strategies that we can use to create alternating copolymers. We won't go into the details on that, but more advanced courses in polymer chemistry will introduce you to ways that you can make alternating copolymers using, for example, cleverly designed polymerization catalysts. Block copolymers are kind of like alternating copolymers, but contain groups of identical monomer units that vary a little bit in size. And a block copolymer can contain more than just two types of monomers. It can contain more than just two types of, of blocks. So for example, in this hypothetical block copolymer here, we've got a block of red, three red monomer units. We've got three blue monomer units in the second block, and we've got three green monomer units in the third block. And again, these blocks don't necessarily need to be of equal size. They can vary in size, but the difference between this and an alternating copolymer is that we've got more than one monomer unit there, right? We've got a block of 3 or 10 or 20 or 100, right? Some number of monomer units before the next monomer kind of starts along the chain and so on and so forth. Graft copolymers contain a polymer backbone with chains branching from that polymer backbone that are grafted onto the main chain. So here, for example, we have, we can think of it like a main chain of red monomer units, and branching off of that main chain is the grafted sort of side chain, but the side chain is itself a polymer. So we've got distinct monomer units here in blue that are linked to the side chains of the polymer backbone. And there are different ways to kind of grow that grafted polymer side chain, quote unquote, off the main chain, or we could pre-polymerize this and then link it on to the red chain. Variety of ways to create graft copolymers. So these are the four different ways that we can think about copolymer structure. We've got graft copolymers, block copolymers, alternating copolymers, and statistical or random copolymers. To put this idea into practice, let's imagine drawing an alternating copolymer composed of two monomers, styrene and ethylene. And to start, let's remind ourselves of the structures of the monomer unit. So styrene is alkenylbenzene, or 1-phenylethylene, if you like, or, or ethene. This is styrene, and then ethylene, well, that's just C2H4. And so an alternating copolymer is going to contain styrene and ethylene units adjacent to each other. So let's actually draw the styrene in red and the ethylene in blue using kind of the same color convention that we've been using previously. And polymerization here is going to involve repeated addition of the styrene to the ethylene and then the ethylene to the styrene, the styrene to the ethylene, ethylene to the styrene, over and over and over and over and over again. So the backbone is going to consist of alternating carbons from the styrene and carbons from the ethylene. So let's draw that. So let's start with the styrene, and then let's use 
a bond here in black to represent a linkage between the styrene and ethylene. And here's a bond that was present in the original ethylene monomer. And then here's another bond to the next styrene monomer and so on and so forth. So we've got as a repeating unit, something like this. And we know this is going to regularly repeat because we're dealing with an alternating copolymer. Now here, we need to keep in mind that the styrene has a phenyl substituent off of it, right? So the styrene monomer is going to have a phenyl substituent, but the ethylene monomer will not, right? The ethylene monomer is just going to have CH2, CH2. So we end up with a repeating unit with a CHPH on one end and then a CH2 on the other end and a CH2 and CH2 due to the ethylene monomer there. And we could, of course, extend this out, right? So we could draw this entire alternating repeating unit again. And the basic idea of the overall structure of the polymer is going to be something like this. We have a red and then a blue. And then I can use copy and paste to kind of duplicate this. We have a red and a blue again. We have a red and a blue again. And it just repeats over and over again until we hit the end of the polymer chain. Notice also that we could have drawn this sort of flipped over, right, with the styrene monomer over here and the ethylene monomer over here. That would have corresponded to the exact same polymer, just drawn from a different perspective, right, in essence, where we sort of flip over the polymer backbone. Here we're going to draw a block copolymer constructed from a propylene monomer and vinyl chloride monomer. So once again, let's remind ourselves of the structures of these monomers. Propylene is propene, that is an alkene linked to a methyl group, and vinyl chloride is an alkene linked to a chlorine. And so we want to draw these in a block copolymer. Now let's think about this kind of on an abstract level first. A block copolymer has a series of identical monomer units followed by a series of identical units of the other monomer, not necessarily of the same size, and so on and so forth. So as an example of a block copolymer here, we might imagine several propylene molecules polymerizing. So let's start actually with sort of our in-group there in black. We might imagine, you know, say three propylenes polymerizing like this with their methyl groups coming off like so. And then next we have, let's say, four vinyl chloride monomers, one, two, three, four, with their chlorines coming off here. And then at some point we go back to the next block of propylene monomers. So something like, say, three more propylene monomers gives us a structure that looks like this, and I'm realizing I have missed a chlorine monomer there. And so, you know, we could imagine that these, these bonds on the end sort of go, go on, and one way that you'll sometimes see polymer structures drawn is that these bonds that extend to further polymer chains are drawn as dotted lines like this as opposed to solid lines, which would kind of evoke the idea of the chain ending. The dotted lines indicate that the chain goes on. So this is an example of a block copolymer, kind of an ABA type block copolymer, right? Where we have that A monomer, the propylene, followed by a block of the B monomer, followed by another block of the A monomer here on the right-hand side. This slide touches on some of the important ideas about intermolecular forces that we often need to think about when it comes to polymers. Polymers tend to exhibit pretty strong London dispersion forces because the molecules are very large, right? Polymer molecules are very large, have huge surface area, and when those surface areas come into contact, we get London dispersion forces. Very large polarizability, right, along a polymer chain. And so, um, even a polymer like polyethylene, which is made of what would seem to be very weakly interacting CH2 groups, exists as a solid because of these very strong London dispersion forces in long 
polyethylene chain. Dipole-dipole interactions are also observed between polymer chains. For example, in this polyester, we've got a carbonyl group, and so we have the negatively charged oxygen atom, partially negative oxygen atom, interacting with the partially positive carbonyl carbon. These kinds of dipole-dipole interactions can be important in polyesters, for example. And then there's hydrogen bonding, which is even stronger than a typical dipole-dipole interaction. Hydrogen bonding is critical in proteins. For example, hydrogen bonding between the amide NH and the amide carbonyl oxygen is critical in holding certain types of secondary structures in proteins together. So hydrogen bonding is yet another type of intermolecular force that can occur in polymers. And one important lesson of this slide that the images hopefully evoke for you is that the effects of intermolecular forces are amplified in polymers because we have along even a polymer backbone of moderate size a huge number of these intermolecular forces. Huge number of hydrogen bonds in a typical protein. Huge number of dipole-dipole interactions in a typical polyester, for example. And so a subtle change to the nature of a functional group inside a monomer can have huge effects on the material properties of the polymer.